Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Air Raid Hour. My name is Steve Mathis. You can find me on Twitter at Judge Mathis. Joined, as always, by my co-host, Dave Tilton. You can find him on Twitter at Tilt Money. And I think my dogs are fighting in the other room there. Uh, <laughs> by Ken- Kendall Mersky as well. You can find him on Twitter uh, at Mersky Kendall. Together, we are the Bills, guys. This is the Air Raid Hour presented by the Cover One Sports Network and... By Picasso's Pizza. Head on over to picassospizza.net. They have four great locations in western New York, Williamsville, West Seneca, Lancaster, and Blaisdell. If you are out of their delivery range, they can door dash it to you and find other means of delivery via their website. And if you're an out-of-towner and you're missing those little tiny pepperoni cups, you can mm-hmm. order frozen pizzas online and have them delivered all across the country. Again, picassospizza.net. They are the uh, sponsor of what we call here the Air Raid Hour. And gentlemen, I mean, we were ready to go back and talk draft tonight. Mm. And then the Buffalo Bills went and Mm. made a slew of signings. Since the last time we spoke on Thursday, the Buffalo Bills have officially added Shaq Lawson. They have added Case Keenum. They have added Matt Barkley. They have added Duke Johnson. They have added Greg Manns. And they have added Jamison Crowder. Mm -hmm. Uh, who just recently came down via the wire about an hour and a half, two hours ago. So let's start there this evening. I'm going to put up a graphic here of the Buffalo Bills wide receiver room and where it currently stands right now. You got Stefan Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Jamison Crowder, and Isaiah McKenzie making up your core four wide receivers for now. And the depth receivers on this team, Jay Kumaro, Marquez Stevenson, Isaiah Hodgins, and Tanner Gentry. So, Dave, I'm going to start with you. What are your thoughts on the addition of Jamison Crowder? I mean, I think it's a great addition. I think Kendall mentioned him as one of our free agent wide receiver options back you know, several shows ago. We did our snake draft on offense. Look, slot guy through and through. Jamison Crowder has been productive with Washington, with the Jets. Um, and let's be perfectly honest. He hasn't had the best quarterback play, um, in either situation that he's been in, but he's managed to put up seasons of 67 receptions, 66, 78 in 2019. He's never had fewer than 29 receptions in a season. And that was a season where he only played in nine games. You take that season out. He's never had fewer than 51 receptions in a season. And we know from our time playing against him in the division the last three years, he is a guy that you have to respect. I mean, he's been on our, you know, uh, segment, like who do you have to respect on the other team when we played the Jets? Like he's his name has come up multiple times because the Bills have struggled against slot receivers and receivers over the middle. And Jamison Crowder fits the bill. Look, he's only uh, 28. He's turning 29 in June. So he'll be entering his age 29 season. He feels like he's 32 years old. I know it's not, (laughs) it's not all that different from the situation. Mm -hmm. Cole Beasley found himself in, albeit Cole Beasley spent his entire career with Dallas before he came to the bills. But man, um, you're talking about a guy who's still very much in his prime in Jamison Crowder and is very familiar with that slot position. He's a slot maven, as we like to say, and Mm -hmm. I think he'll fit in great uh, with this team. And by the way, um, it gives the bills just that added bit more of flexibility now when it comes to the draft in terms of going after mm-hmm. receivers, because we've always talked about how Bean likes to have options going into the draft by chances. I like Crowder more than Beasley at this point in his career. And at this point in his career, you would say you like the younger player. The reason that you would say, okay, I like Beasley maybe a little bit more for this team is because he's been with the team and he's got that chemistry with Josh mm-hmm. Allen. But as we've seen, with Josh Allen and with receivers that come in and and get acclimated to this team, that really should not be an issue for a guy like Jamison Crowder, who's played with multiple quarterbacks, been in multiple organizations. He's not going to have any problem coming in and fitting in and getting acclimated quickly. He's a professional. Mm -hmm. He's going into his, I think seventh season or eighth season, eighth season, uh, eighth season. So it's not going to be an issue at all for Jamison Crowder to get, get comfortable in this, uh, in this uh, locker room. Yeah, we got a couple of comments. Someone said, you know, he's returned punts as well. He returned punts at Duke. He returned punts for the Washington uh, Commanders when they were the Washington, you know, what's back in the day. I don't know 
if uh, I don't know if he will punt return here for the Buffalo Bills. I think his responsibility is going to be mostly offense. Um, I do think he's been dinged up the last couple of years and he hasn't been playing with great um, wide receiver uh, uh, quarterbacks in New York. So I think Jamison Crowder has a chance to come in here. And if the Bills don't go out and like draft a guy, I think Jamison Crowder has a chance mm. to literally suck up 90% of those Cole Beasley targets. And you could see Jamison Crowder come into Buffalo with the, you know, the world-class medical staff, the way that they allow the players to rest their body playing with Josh Allen. He could have a career here, career year here, and then maybe cash in next mm -hmm. season as like the go-to slot receiver uh, in the 2023 free agent class. So I think it's a good move here for Jamison Crowder to take a discount it's a contract up to $4 million to come here. I mean, we're at the point where Brandon Bean is just telling guys like, listen, I got nothing to offer you, but like a chance to like win a, win a chip. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what he said to Jamison Crowder is like, hey, Jamison, just so you know, like we can pay you up to $4 million if you want to come here. Let us know. And Jamison probably sat on it for about a week, realized he didn't have much better options. Uh, and he's now, you know, here signing this. I mean, he's getting half the money of Braxton Berrios. He's getting six million, seven million less uh, than Juju Smith Schuster. I mean, what an absolute half the money we would have spent on Cole Beasley this season. Uh, maybe even a third of the money, depending on those incentives. I mean, absolutely a steal here for Jamison Crowder. Um, these numbers are via Anthony Prohaska. You can find him on Twitter at ProAnth. He hosts Disguise Coverage and he hosts the film room with you, Kendall. Uh 78.8 reception percentage in his career for Jamison Crowder over seven seasons, 11.2 yards per reception. He's had 76% of his snaps in the slot, 23% of his snaps out wide, 7.7 .7 average depth of target. He's got a 6.4 drop percentage. He ran a 4.56 40-yard dash. He's 5'9", 177 pounds. His career high in receptions was 78 in 2019. I think you could break that this year if he is the one who truly, in fact, slides into that Cole Beasley slot. And uh, his tw his 2016 was his career high in yardage, 847. I think he's got a chance to beat that if he truly slides into that Cole Beasley spot. But he's going to have Isaiah McKenzie to compete with. He's going to have O.J. Howard to compete with. Mm -hmm. He may have more receiving capable running backs to compete with. But, Kendall, what are your thoughts on the addition of Jamison Crowder? I love it. I think it's a great signing. I think obviously mm -hmm. it strikes value and it's another it's another example of being adding to a position at value in a way that gives him flexibility in the draft. Uh, he has that that insurance, that safe floor at wide receiver three, but it doesn't preclude him from taking a wide receiver in the first round if, if someone falls to him that he finds as a good value. And I think. Mm -hmm. The, the main point for me, and you guys both touched on it, but I'll, I'll do it a little bit more succinctly so we can move on, is really just he's someone that's played with really poor quarterbacks. He's going to be 29 when the year starts, and we're getting him at a fraction of the cost that we would mm -hmm. have paid Cole Beasley. So I think it's a home run in terms of value, and I'm excited to see how he fits into this offense. Dave, you put it nicely by uh, saying how well Josh Allen has done with new wide receivers. So I don't really have any reason to have concern in that regard. And, and one last thing, because that's when mm -hmm. you were talking, it, it reminded me of, of a point here. And you were talking about the value, right? The Bills have gotten to a point where they've tipped the scales when it comes to free agency in general, right? The Bills, from a salary cap perspective, beans out there spending, yes, However, these signings that go under the radar, OJ Howard, three and a half, Jamison Crowder up to four. These are signings that would not have been possible four or five years ago before this team became a contender, nope. right? You don't have the luxury four or five years ago to sign a one, a guy, a, a guy in his prime for one year deal on a bargain for him to essentially parlay that into a potential multi-year deal the year after. If you weren't in a position of success that the bills have had, mm -hmm over the last couple of seasons and if you didn't have Josh Allen. So while yes, you are out there and you're going out and you're splashing and you're signing a Von Miller, you are not able to make some of these other signings. If you don't have the success on the field mm -hmm. that you have, and it's a hard thing to do, right? You have to get to that tipping point as a franchise and as an organization to where you can get yourself into that position. And obviously easier said than done, but the bills are now in that position where they can do that. And it's great. It's great to see. And I mean, speaking of, 
speaking of guys, you know, we wouldn't have been able to get three, four years ago. How about the new backup quarterback in Buffalo taking a pay cut, slicing his contract in half? Case Keenum down to about three and a half million dollars. The Buffalo Bills traded their seventh round pick to the Cleveland Browns for Case Keenum. So the Buffalo Bills quarterback depth chart now stands at Josh Allen, Case Keenum, and Matt Barkley. Uh, I think Greg Tom Set said it on Twitter. He's like, listen, between the combination of Josh Allen, the combination of Case Keenum and Matt Barkley, and you have Joe Brady and Ken Dorsey, all of those quarterbacks, those former quarterbacks in the room, mm -hmm. the Buffalo Bills have probably the greatest set of like quarterback minds in the league right now. They probably have the best, um, you know, and most qualified quarterback room in the entire NFL. Uh, Ken, I'm going to start with you. Then we're going to hit by chances, super chat. And then Dave, <laughs> I'm going to get your thoughts on, um, you know, the addition of Case Keenum and the return of Matt Barkley. Uh, I think the big thing with Case Keenum is, uh, yeah, Pops Mafia just put it in here. He's willing to take a pay cut because he just got paid a million dollars <laughs> being on the roster for the Browns. So it's easy to take a pay cut when you get that uh, and then you get traded in that way. Greg put it so nicely saying the Bills on Twitter, the Bills gave uh, a seventh round pick for Case Keenum. Otherwise, a guy that's going to have a real tough chance of making this roster turning that seventh round pick into our backup quarterback mm -hmm. and then getting him on a pay cut. It's, it's a home run. It's a great ad. He's someone that I don't, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Hey, if Josh Allen goes down for the year, knock on wood, I mean, the season's over anyways, if he mm -hmm. goes out for four or five games, you trust case Keenum could win two, maybe three. So mm -hmm. that that's really the upside there. And then the nice part about having Matt Barkley back is, I mean, what he floated around on like three teams last year. I don't think anyone's yeah. taking him from the practice squad. Yeah, no, I, I think that Matt Barkley's spot here is going to be sort of the Davis Webb role. Yes. I, like, yep. and and I, I mentioned this on Twitter. I think what the Bills the Bills did, Brandon Bean did, was he called up Matt Barkley and was like, "Listen, Matt, come back to Buffalo. You were on three teams last year. Like, I mean, you were living out of a suitcase. Come back to Buffalo, be our number two quarterback." ends up being the number three uh, and Brandon Bean probably told him you'd end up being in a, more than likely be the number three. Cause I think Barkley's deal was worked out before the Keenum trade, but then mm -hmm. Keenum actually was acquired before Barkley, but Hey, come here, be the number three, be the training camp arm, hang out with your best buddy, Josh Allen. We're probably going to cut you. Um, you know, and if another team comes a call in and wants you to be the backup quarterback, great. But you know, we're allowed to put veterans on the practice squad. Now just be our third quarterback, sit on the practice squad, collect a practice squad, check, and, uh, you know, just live your best life, man. Don't live your life out of a suitcase. Uh, and I think Matt Barkley, like at this stage in his career is probably like, all right, this is the best deal I'm going to get. Like if you're Matt Barkley, do you want to chase backup gigs and be on four teams in a season? Or do you just want to be a nice, safe, cozy place that you like in Buffalo? Be the QB three. If somebody gets hurt, you're the QB two. Uh, I think Matt Barkley just realized that this was the best position for him. And kudos for, to Brandon Bean. A, a multitude of people have said this now. I think Bruce Exclusive, Bruce Nolan was one of the first ones on it. It's like, how great of Brandon Bean just to foster an environment where guys can come back here like no judgment. Jordan, yeah. Jordan Phillips, Shaq Lawson, Matt Barkley. You know, they can all come back here, no judgment. Um, you know, so Matt Barkley is likely to be the number three quarterback. And Dave, I'll just tell you this before we get to by chance the Super Chat here. We sat here and we've had... 10 minute conversations, 20 minute conversations about who is the heck is going to be the Buffalo Bills backup quarterback this year, all off season. In what world did any of us picture Case Keenan being a viable option? And he might end up being the best of the options. I mean, Jameis yeah. Winston just got paid. Marcus Mariota just got paid. You know, we were talking about it. Like everyone was waiting for the musical chairs to fall. When the mm -hmm. musical chairs fell, there literally was no one left. The only one left right now is Baker Mayfield and Jimmy Garoppolo, which are not options for the Buffalo Bills. So Kudos to Brandon Bean for going out and finding this trade, a guy we didn't expect. Definitely. And I mean, for the Browns, right? I mean, mm -hmm. no harm, right? You're just clearing cap space at this point. You've got the Sean Watson now in the house. So like Case Keenum really wasn't needed there anymore. And so he's at the end of his career. Um, he has a chance to just kind of hold a clipboard. And like you said, two, three, four games, is why you why you get this guy right you're not mm -hmm. getting him because you think that he's gonna carry this team through the playoffs in the super bowl if something happens to josh allen you're carrying him in the off chance that josh allen misses a game or two or maybe even three or four mm -hmm. and he can he can navigate that stretch for you yeah keep you afloat 
as far as far as Matt Barkley, I, I'm totally agree. I mean, Matt Barkley, for as much as he's bounced around the league, and as much as you know, it probably maybe maybe it doesn't hurt his ego to come mm-hmm. back and kind of fill this role. But let's be real: if you're Matt Barkley and you look yourself in the mirror and you're like, "I've made a pretty good career NFL career for myself as a backup slash third string quarterback," mm-hmm. when at this point, I'm looking at it and like I've been in the league for like ten years, right? I mean, like, it, like it's a, not a bad situation for Matt Barkley to be well, in. He's got all that crypto. He's got that crypto, and he gets to be in a place where he's familiar and comfortable, and possibly enjoy the ride, right? If you're Matt mm-hmm. Barkley on a championship caliber team, right? Like part of that is like you're going to be with this group of guys, yeah. For and and like, w- wouldn't you want to be? in an environment like that Mm -hmm. as you kind of go through the latter stages of your career. Um, Same really for Case Keenum, because outside of that run in Minnesota where we, you know, we obviously know the Minneapolis miracle, like not a ton of experience or, or or even uh, as a backup in in the playoffs for Case. So it's a good situation for him too to kind of go on this ride at the latter stage of his stages of his career. So good for both of them. Um, And the trade made a ton of sense, right? Because, seventh round pick, like Kendall said, like that guy's probably not making the team anyway. Mm -hmm. And so to get your backup quarterback by trading a seventh round pick, when you have two sixths and two sevens to start with, uh, no brainer for me. Mm -hmm. And now you, you get that quarterback who we've been talking about, like, well, who at the end of the draft do we kind of like as a free free agent or all that worked for nothing. Now we don't have to worry about it. Now we don't have to worry about (laughs) it. Right. So yeah, great. Great. All of them. I don't even think that like a UDFA or anything is even, I think the only way the Buffalo bills add a rookie quarterback is sort of like the Jake from effect. Like if you're sitting in the fifth round and like, or sixth round even, and like Bailey zap sitting there or like somehow like a Carson strong has fallen and fallen, fallen. Like there's just a quarterback that everyone thought was going to be a second or third rounder that is chilling there in the fifth or sixth round. Maybe you consider pulling the trigger, but obviously this quarter, honestly, this quarterback class isn't that strong. Yeah, maybe they add a UDFA arm like a Chase Garbers or a Cole Kelly, et cetera. But it is what it is. If they don't at this point, like who cares? Because like it's doesn't matter. It's set. Like it the quarterback matter. room is set. You made a great point when you talked about Matt Barkley. You don't need him for a full season. You need him for two or three, four games. You know, Josh Allen, the way he plays, one knock to the head, he's in concussion protocol. How about just one game finishing a game? Right? Mm-hmm. Like uh, you're not going to trust a lot of quarterbacks to come in mm-hmm. cold. And to go when you have closed you a football game, say Josh Allen gets you a 10 point lead, but then gets knocked, knock on wood, gets knocked out of the football game, middle of the third quarter. You want a quarterback to go in there and help you maintain that lead to Ooh. drive the ball down the field, to not put too much pressure on your defense. Case Keenum is that guy who can come in cold because he's been there. He's done that. He's played so much football that he can do that for you. So I really think that is a good uh, part of uh, what Case Keenum offers as well. Finally get into the super chat. I apologize by chance. Uh, but it perfectly sets up sort of our next week segment here. He says, Bean has had a great offseason thus far, but two of our holes last year have gotten even worse. Offensive line and cornerback rooms are bad right now with practically no cap left. Trey White, who knows if he's me back to start the season? I wouldn't bank on it. Nope. You have um, Dane Jackson. You have Nick McLeod. You have Elijah Griffin. You have Tim Harris. You have Cam Lewis. Obviously, you have Teron Johnson, but he's more of a slot option. Mm-hmm. Dave, we'll get to offensive line in a second. What are your thoughts on the lack of addressing cornerback, and does that scare you? Um, it doesn't yet because I spent so much time last offseason talking about how I wanted a cornerback in the first round, and the Bills totally just bypassed that and went with what they had, and they were fine with it. Now, last year, they had Levi Wallace and... Dane Jackson in the mix next to Trey white, who wasn't coming off injury. So it's a little bit of a different situation. However, when you look at the first round of this draft and you look at what two positions stand out as having the best chance of a top tier talent getting to you at 25, to me, it's wide receiver and it's cornerback. And I think the bills are sitting there looking like, okay, we have some faith in Elijah Griffin, a Griffin signed into a two year, two year futures contract. We still like Nick McLeod. We still have faith in Dane Jackson. We'll see what happens with Trey white. Like I could see that. I could see the bills saying like, look, like we're pick 25. Like there's going to be out of six, seven great corners. 
that could be picked in the top 30, 35 picks. One of those guys is going to be available for us. And now maybe is mm-hmm. the time for us to go back to that and picking a corner early for the first time since Trey white was picked right in yeah. McDermott's first year here. Now that is a, maybe a dangerous or a slippery slope to go down, but, but just from a numbers <laughs> game, if you're happy, if you'd be happy with five or six of these different guys, whether it's McCreary, McDuffie, whoever, Eli, like if you're happy with mm-hmm. any of those guys, then maybe that's the, uh, the thought process there. Also, by the way, there's still a ton of bargain bin cornerback mm-hmm. free agents out there. Should the bills want to do anything more with set the salary cap, give, give Stefan Diggs an extension, restructure Trey Wright, restructure Deion Dawkins. There is still some maneuverability there for you to make mm-hmm. room to sign a bargain bin cornerback. Cause yep. to be honest with you, I don't even know what the bills cap situation. is. <laughs> no one does. No, no idea. So, yeah, I'm not even, uh, there's a couple people in the comment section that are like, how much money do we have? No, nope. but there are options. <laughs> there are bargain bin free agent options <laughs> still out the, there. Joe Hayden is a name mm-hmm. that people can. He's the yeah. The writing's on the wall there. Yeah, yeah, the the combination of uh, what was it? Him liking and retweeting Von Miller to the Bills. Stefan Diggs liking a bunch of his stuff. Mm-hmm. So there's been a couple of like sort of hints on social media that maybe Joe Hayden is coming to Buffalo. And you know this has been sort of the 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 wild like the wildest dreams off season, right? Like the craziest things that we didn't expect are going to happen have happened. Why not have Andrew Booth Jr. drop to 25 in the draft? Like that's <laughs> that's. That's my number one goal right now is just to have hit his inability to, to work out, um, drop Andrew Booth Jr. to the Bills at 25. Uh, he obviously got hurt uh, preparing for the combine, didn't work out the combine, didn't work out at Clemson's Pro Day. So my hopes is that Andrew Booth Jr. drops uh, to the Buffalo Bills at 25. But even if he doesn't, guys like Kyler Gordon, you mentioned Kyrie Elam, second or third round, guys like Cam Taylor Britt, Mario Goodrich, et cetera, like, the, the Buffalo Bills can easily plug and play a guy that they draft in the first three rounds, especially with the way that uh, they sort of developed corners over the year uh, years. We've got uh, your boy Lettuce coming in, says disregard Dogecoin, acquire punt God. <laughs> hey, the more we add to this roster, the more likely uh, we are to draft a punter in the fourth round. I will tell you that, your boy Lettuce. Uh, Kendall, what are your thoughts? Are you concerned about cornerback number two right now? Not really. Um I'm not worried because Bean wouldn't be avoiding it like this if he didn't have a plan. I think he, mm-hmm. at this point, I think he's avoiding it because of obviously the Von Miller signing. He talked about it in his presser. Like when you sign a guy like Von Miller, you have to take a hit somewhere else on your roster. I think he's higher on Dane Jackson mm-hmm. than a lot of people in this world are. And I, I don't think he's wrong to think that. I think we've seen a lot of sufficient stuff from Dane Jackson. Um, but I think everyone's concerned about him being CB one week one with Trey white, possibly not being mm-hmm. available. So that is concerning, but yeah. you look back to his time with the Panthers and uh, the year that he lost uh, Josh Norman, the year after he drafted two corners in the draft. And if he thinks that this draft is deep enough at that position and he's draft confident two. draft mm-hmm. two, and I'm, I'm right now considering where he's at and the way he's gone about free agency, I think it makes sense to get your Joe Hayden of the world and, you know, live on that vet minimum deal or something close to Mm -hmm. it and then have two rookies. One ideally can come in and start right away. And the other one can be waiting, developing behind him. Someone that can come in, play CB2 if there's an injury, something like that, or compete with Joe Hayden for the CB2 uh, asterisk injury position. Mm -hmm. So I, I I'm not concerned because it seems like Bean has a plan. And I, I know that there are a ton of cornerbacks that are yeah. sufficient and workable in, in yeah. the mid to late rounds. Mm-hmm. You know, Bean mentioned at his presser uh, that, you know, like, hey, there could be a guy closer to training camp that gets cut after the draft that becomes a salary cap casualty. True. That gets cut during training camp, et cetera, et cetera. Like, me personally, if I was the general manager of the Buffalo Bills, I'd want my CB2 role filled before I head to the draft. But Brandon Bean, possibly, uh, we, we don't know. He could make a move 15 seconds from now for all we know, the way he's been operating. He very well could head into the draft with a, a, a seemingly a hole there yeah. at CB2. And I don't even think that means that they have to even draft a guy early. Um, you know, because like you said, like, is Steven Nelson going to sign anywhere anytime soon? Patrick Peterson, Robert Alford, Joe Hayden. 
uh, Fabian Moreau. Like there's a ton of dudes who are to Bryce Callahan. Like there's a ton of dudes who are still on the market. And a lot of them likely will be on the market until after the draft, mm -hmm. because that's one of the things where free agency comes before the draft and, you know, teams want to fill their holes so they can draft best player available. But also like, you know, teams also want, don't want to sign those guys because they don't want to guarantee any money. Uh, and they want to see if they can draft a guy, but then the draft doesn't go their way. And then they go, mm -hmm. they go a call in those guys. So a lot of those guys could still be sitting there waiting for you after the draft. So all four drafted multiple guys corner looks like it's a huge need right now, glaring hole in the roster. And the other is offensive line. Taking a look at the Buffalo bills, offensive line here at tackle. They got Deion Dawkins. They got Spencer Brown. They got Tommy Doyle. That's it at offensive tackle. Like off the tackle might be something we don't talk about enough here because there's literally no depth there. You think they're going to take at least five guys into training camp at this position, probably six. So there's two, three additions at offensive tackle that need to be made. On the interior, Mitch Morse is going to be your center. Roger Saffold's going to be your left guard. And as of right now, Cody Ford is your left guard. Or I'm sorry, your right guard. Greg Mann signed today. He's sort of like a Jameel Douglas kind of type of signing, right? Like he's got guard center flags. He started some games in this league, but all in all, he's just very replacement level uh, type of player. And then they got some guy named Jacob Capra. Ryan Bates is an RFA. He's visited with the Vikings. He's visited with the Patriots. He is going to visit with Chicago. So we're still waiting on pins and needles for that sort of decision from Ryan Bates. Are you going to get a contract from somebody? And then you got seven days to figure out whether the bills are going to match it or not. So it could be another week or two weeks before we figure out whether Ryan Bates truly is on this roster or not. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. As much as I want corner at 25, and as much as I think corner would be the smarter player at 25 because I like the depth of the offensive line in this class, a player that sticks out like a sore thumb to me at 25 is Zion Johnson. Yep. What are your thoughts on Zion at 25? I mean, I talked about it on not this past Thursday show, but on the last Monday show, right? I, uh, and I mentioned it to Aaron as well on Twitter, and it's picking up steam, right? The cover one staff, at least some of us are kind of getting behind that idea of Zion at 25. I absolutely love the idea because the fact of the matter is, is that Roger Saffold is here for one year. You don't know what's going to happen with Ryan. Ba for all we know, Ryan Bates could be gone. And then you're left with Roger Saffold at left guard for one year. And what the hell at right guard, Cody Ford, and who the hell knows what's going to happen with him mm -hmm. going into this season. So to me, the future at guard, even really for 2022, especially at right guard, is still very murky. So mm -hmm. I am all for get, drafting a guy like Zion Johnson at 25 if it presents itself. And the fact of the matter is there, too, is he can ultimately end up being your backup center if you need him to be based on what we've seen uh, as far as him being willing to kind of learn that position and taking mm -hmm. the initiative to do that. Now, I'm not saying day one he's going to be the backup center. But I am saying that day one, if you draft Zion Johnson at 25, he will be your starting right guard uh, to open the season and potentially be your long-term either right guard or left guard, depending on how things shake mm -hmm. out beyond 2022. So I'm very open to that idea, especially if Ryan Bates um, signs elsewhere, because it's great to have yeah. Saffold in the mix for 2022. But at some point, I think the musical chairs of the interior offensive line needs to settle down a bit. And we need, we do need some st stability, at least with one of the guard and, positions at the interior. Yeah. I'm not saying both, but one of them needs to be yeah. settled. And the, the two guys that stick out like a sore thumb to me at 25, if he drops Linderbaum, because I think with the Cromer Linderbaum could play guard. And the other is uh, the other is Zion Johnson, Mitch Morse, you know, is going to be your center for the next year or two. Roger Saffold's probably a one year buy. We don't know. Uh, Ryan Bates is future. So looking, projecting into the future, two years, three years down the road, a lot of blank space on the depth chart at guard. Yeah. So a guy like Zion Johnson or Tyler Linderbaum gives you a stud. If you hit on the pick, obviously, which you would assume they do. I think we all would think that these guys would be hits. That guy is going to secure, or at least give you a secure body on the interior for five years. Zion Johnson could potentially be your future center too. He did yep. some center, some snapping at the senior bowl. You can work with him over the course of two, three years to prepare him for that. If that's something you want to do yep. um, behind Mitch Morse and Tyler Linderbaum, if you want to play him at guard for a year or two, 
um, you know, and then slide him into the center job. If Linderbaum drops, he's a guy you can have there too. I'm all in on Zion. I'm all in on Linderbaum because on top of being, you know, the value isn't there because they're interior offensive linemen, but I think they're such plus athletes that the value is there. The only guy I'm out on is Kenyon Green because he didn't test so well. I wouldn't feel comfortable taking him at 25. I just don't know what the value is there for a Kenyon Green. I still like Kenyon Green. I just don't know if I like him at 25. Kendall, what are your thoughts on what we need to do, how we need to address this lack of depth along the interior offensive line? I, I definitely think it's it's in the cards for those like first three rounds. I think we should mm-hmm. spend a premium pick on the position for pretty much every reason you guys have been talking about. The fact that the future at the position isn't all that clear. Uh, like Dave was saying, Roger Saffold is on the roster for 2022. That's great. But what's beyond that? Um, we don't know if Bates is coming back. If Bates comes back, it's a slightly different story, but we've we've seen year after year, they don't seem to value him the way the, the fan base does. So if he's brought back for this year, is that another 2022 patchwork type of job? Or is that a guy that they prioritize to bring back for the future and extend him like you want so so badly, mm-hmm. Judge? But it just, <laughs> it just hasn't been happening. So mm-hmm. I, I definitely agree with everything you guys said, um, especially in terms of really those top three guys, Tyler Linderbaum, uh, Zion Johnson and Kenyon Green. I'd, I'd be comfortable with all three of them in the first round. I agree with you, Judge. Kenyon Green is the one that gives me the most pause just because of mm-hmm. um, the testing stuff. But, you know, if we get him in the in the strength and conditioning program, maybe, you know, lean him out a little bit. Maybe he'd be a better fit for this zone scheme. His tape is pretty good, so it's tough to ignore that side of things. But um, I definitely think he's the one that gives the most cause for concern, yeah. despite such a great um, early draft process hype mm-hmm. from him. Yeah, you got your boy Les coming in the super chat. He says, grab uh, Hayden. I believe he's referring to Joe Hayden there. Draft McCreary, Olave, Fortner, Punt God. I think it'd have to go Olave, McCreary, Fortner, Punt God. Uh, likely and some ham sandwiches. Off season is set. Hey, listen, if we can get all of those guys, I would be. A happy man. Luke Fortner is one of my favorites on the interior. Uh, all right. Seeing a couple people come in and talking about Duke Johnson. So let's shift the focus here to the running back room because that's the theme of our show today. We are going to be breaking down the draft board round by round. What running backs should be available in every round and when are the Buffalo Bills going to find the running back that fits them and the value that fits them. So that's the conversation that we're going to be having here now sort of in the back half of the show. So let's take a look at this running back depth chart it's three deep Devin Singletary Zach Moss and today's free agent acquisition Duke Johnson uh one of the guys that I had sort of highlighted as a bargain bin option um you know my comment on Twitter today was he's a Matt Breida replacement Matt Breida actually I think just signed with the New York Giants today another uh former Bill heading to the New York Giants but to me Duke Johnson box score statistics over like the last five six years better than JD McKissick, but I think box score statistics don't tell the whole story. I much rather would have had JD McKissick than Duke Johnson, but I do think he adds some layers to this offense and it's showing that maybe the bills wanted sort of a type. Uh, They were looking for a type at running back. Brandon Bean was on the Pat McAfee show today. And he said like, man, this draft has got some running backs who are practically wide receivers and talking about their ability to catch passes. So maybe these are some hints as to like what Brandon Bean is looking for in a running back what are your thoughts here dave on uh, on duke johnson and then kendall get your thoughts on duke johnson and then we'll get into this sort of draft talk here on running backs yeah i mean it's no secret that throughout his career he's been used as a receiving back he's even been used as a receiver uh, Mm -hmm. for the with the browns for a few of those seasons there i always thought he was kind of misutilized um i don't know that i i do think you have to have the right offensive coaching staff uh, in place to figure out the ideal way to use Duke Johnson. I think with the Texans, uh, it might've been two years ago. He had some nice, uh, he had some nice games, uh, mixed in there when David Johnson was out. Um, I, I think he's got talent. I think that it it is a totally fine consolation for w- what happened with the JD McKissick situation. Mm-hmm. Like we were talking about this in the cover one staff chat, right? Like, yeah, like most people would have preferred McKissick, but like is Duke Johnson really all that much different from like what type of player you're getting? Like not all that much different, to be honest. Like, I mean, the receiving type back, I think McKissick is a little stouter 
um, maybe. Um, but again, I don't think this really changes the plan necessarily for the Bills. I think that they're saving money, I think, by by having Duke Johnson over McKissick. But to what you said, Steve, it shows mm. me that they were looking for a type. They were looking yep. for a guy with receiving chops out of the backfield. And when we start talking about the running backs in this draft, I'm I'm still going to be very much looking at that type of back because Duke Johnson's not the long term answer as the as that option. And if the Bills really do feel a way about Devin Singletary keeping him on this roster um, beyond you know beyond this year, do they want to have a complement in the form of a true receiving back then to come in based on the fact that they went after a guy like McKissick and now signed Duke Johnson? To me, what this says is like it's more of a question of what the role might be for a guy like Zach Moss than it is mm -hmm. anything else. Because in my mind, I think when mm -hmm. you're signing Duke Johnson here, I I think it – me personally, and it's just my opinion, I think the expectations for what I would hope to get out of Duke Johnson are higher than what I would have hoped to get out of Matt Breida last year. Matt Breida, mm -hmm. to me, felt like yeah. a body. And, yes, he had some speed and, like, he had some nice stint – some nice moments in San Francisco, but Duke Johnson to me still has more to offer uh, than a guy like Matt Breida. So um, it will be determined whether or not he makes it all the way through, like it makes to the 53, but I don't think it stops the bills from going after a running back in the mm -hmm. draft. But now I'm kind of thinking like the bills may be looking for that receiving back yeah. type option in the draft. And maybe this can becomes a competition between maybe it becomes a, three-man competition for two roster spots between Zach Moss and Duke Johnson. Now, it'll be very unlikely, I would say, for Zach Moss not to be on the team. So maybe yeah. it comes down to a draft pick against Duke Johnson for that third and final running yeah. back spot. I, I think what you're looking at here, to me, you're, you're, you hit the nail on the head. I think Duke Johnson is probably more highly thought of than Matt Breida just based on like the timing of it. Duke Johnson mm -hmm. was still like – within a week of free agency starting, whereas Brita was weeks later. So even though Duke Johnson was the second choice, clearly um, he was still signed significantly quicker than a Matt Brita was. Um, but I also don't think like when the bills signed JD McKissick, they had a plan in mind for JD McKissick. I mean, they, they him, we're going to give him $7 million, $8 mm, million. I think they, you have a plan for a guy he, when you're giving a backup running back that much money. He yeah. was going to be their third down back for the next two years. He was going to be the guy that they relied on in their passing sets. I think they had a major role carved out for a JD McKissick. I just don't envision that with, with a guy like Duke Johnson. I think he literally comes in and it's all right, you know, Duke. All right, Zach. Which one of you impress us most? That one's going to be active. The only thing that would throw a wrench into that is the draft. So uh, with that being said, we're going to get to that super chat in a second, but Kendall, what are your thoughts on the Duke Johnson signing? Uh, I think Dave highlighted it really well by using the word consolation prize. I, I think that's exactly what it is. I think it's an adequate mm -hmm. consolation prize for missing out on JD McKissick, especially the way that we did. But the thing that I'm more excited about is that I think he offers more as a runner. McKissick was sufficient as a runner. Um, but in between the tackles, there is something left to be desired. And Duke Johnson isn't great in that regard, but I think he's better. And specifically, I think he's more creative with the ball in his hands. I think he's better after contact. He can make more out of nothing. He can make players myths, stuff like that. But you're not going to get the same like mm -hmm. pass catching ability and route running acumen ability to be like flex in the slot as efficiently as McKissick was so where you miss in the receiving game he's still good but he's not McKissick mm -hmm. where you miss there he makes up for it in the run game so I think that's what's kind of exciting about it but I, I think it's mm -hmm. it's really just an adequate consolation prize and yeah we'll see how it plays out with any mm -hmm. maybe draft pick so John DeVazio comes in and says fellows the tape don't lie watch the last six games of the season Singletary is our guy we just need depth that was the thing with that was the thing with McKissick I thought McKissick complimented Devin Singletary perfectly. Right. You have Devin Singletary on first and second down. You have JD McKissick on third down. And you also probably utilize JD McKissick when we're in sort of a hurry up or two minutes two minute of offense. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, Duke Johnson, maybe he can compete and win that role, but I don't know. So now we head into the draft and what do the Bills want in the draft? Do they go and look for a JD McKissick type? There's a ton. We're about to draft. We're going to talk about to talk about some of them. Um, or do they 
go for a three down back. Like if a three down back falls to them, do the Buffalo Bills consider it? We're switching to Aaron Cromer's coming in and it's weird, right? Because Aaron Cromer has run mostly a zone scheme in his career, or at least he did with the Rams. And a lot of people are expecting us to utilize the zone running scheme a ton. But guys like Eric Wood have come out and said, hey, don't worry. A guy like Aaron Cromer, he likes to use those pin and poles. He likes to get those guards moving. You're going to see some man gap power stuff as well. So it's just a really big question mark, and it's all projection right now. The Bills very well could see Singletary as their guy, but he is a UFA after this year. You usually don't want to give a running back a second contract. Ask some teams how they feel about giving their running backs a second contract. They know it's a different scenario because he's a different type of running back, but ask the Dallas Cowboys how they're feeling about giving Zeke a second contract right now. Um, the one so, caveat I would add to that is I don't think in any way has Devin Singletary played himself out of the price range for the Buffalo Bills. No, I don't, I don't think so either, but also it all depends on what you want to allocate, right? Like, yes. yes. So the plan might have been, the plan for the Bills might have been, let's burn and churn running backs. We're going to mm-hmm. draft Devin Singletary this year. We're going to burn him, churn him, and then Zach Moss will still have one year left on his contract when Devin Singletary is up. Uh, and then you know we'll run Zach Moss, and then we'll draft another guy, and we'll just keep rotating like third-round draft picks, and we're just not going to spend any money at that position. That could also be their game plan, and a wrench could have been thrown in it when Zach Moss didn't develop or wasn't what they thought he was, but he could end up being. Um, he, he could still end up resurrecting his career. Who knows? Some people are going to bash me for even mentioning that or commenting on that, but it looks like the Buffalo Bills are willing to give Cody Ford another chance. So my guess is Zach Moss and Cody Ford are going to have every chance in training camp to at least earn a role on this football team and have a chance to resurrect their careers. So uh, that should all be interesting and it should be interesting to see how that all plays out. But we're going to shift our focus now uh, to the draft. And we're going to be talking about running backs today. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting our draft board at running backs. And we want this Mm. to be as interactive uh, of an experience as possible. So what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through round by round, first round, second round, third round, fourth round, fifth round. And I'm sort of going to give my projection of what running backs I think will be available in each round. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Dave and Kendall, like, who are your favorites on this list? Who do you think, who do you think I have projected in the wrong place? Who do you think I don't have projected in the right, in the wrong place? Like you guys can feel free to join that conversation as well. When I put on my list of guys who I think are going to be available in the second round, if you think I have a guy listed too high, let me know in the comment section as we roll through here. But before we get started, I just want to to add sort of um, a layer of context to what I did. And the first graphic I want to put up is I want to put up my list of who I have as projected undrafted free agents. Because I posted this on Twitter earlier, and it sort of got a rise out of some people in the comment section. These are the names of the running backs that I don't think are going to be drafted. Kevin Harris, Tristan Ebner, Jerry Ely, Kennedy Brooks, Cameron Harris, Britton Brown, Ronnie Rivers, Letty Brown, CJ Verdell, um, you know, TJ Pledger. There are some names here of guys who a lot of people assume are going to be drafted or think are going to be drafted that I don't think are going to get drafted. And I want to explain my context here. I went through and I analyzed the last three drafts. The average number of running backs drafted over the last three drafts is 20 running backs. That's it. Only 20 running backs per draft the last three seasons. Go back to do a five-year average. It's 21 running backs. Mm. There are like 35, 36, 37 running backs that I like in this draft that I would draft at some point in this draft. But if you just look at the sheer number of guys who are available to the average of number of running backs that are drafted, unless there's a record breaking number of running backs drafted this year, at least record breaking in terms of compared to the five year average or the three year average, a lot of guys that we think are draftable are going to be undrafted. A lot Mm -hmm. of guys that we think are fourth round prospects are sixth round prospects. And so I think that the way the running back class shakes out is going to surprise some people. So we're going to do our best to set the board today. And I think it's realistic based on the averages. I think some people are think it's going to be unrealistic, unrealistic based on the way that they like some people. Randy Hardman comes in and says, judge, you done messed up with Kevin Harris as a UDFA. I would draft Kevin Harris. I don't think he gets drafted. Ely gets drafted, says by chance. 
I would draft Jerry on Ely. I don't think he gets drafted because of his size. So just because I have that guy listed as a UDFA or a guy listed as a seventh rounder that you think is a fifth rounder doesn't mean I don't like them or that we don't like them. It just means that like, it's a numbers game. Not every team needs a running back. Not everyone's going to draft a running back. Only a certain number of running backs get drafted. So I just want that layer of context. Before what is it like 270 something mm-hmm. picks in the draft or something around there? Or yeah. like it's less than 300, right? I'm yeah. Pretty sure. So uh, it'll be interesting to see the final number uh, with all the compensatory stuff thrown True. in. I can, I can double check by the end of the show here, but um, looking at the draft board, I'm going to put up my first round here. My first two rounds, round one and round two. And here is what went into my projections here. Over the last three seasons, an average of one running back has been drafted in the first round and two running backs have been drafted in the second round, which means over the course of the first two rounds, over the last three years, three running backs have been drafted on average. So somewhere between three, four running backs are likely to go in the first two rounds of the draft. It is highly unlikely that a running back goes in the first round. Now, if Leonard Fournette, say, signs with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I can easily see, like, or I'm sorry, the, the New England Patriots, I could see Tampa Bay splurging. You know, there, but there's not many teams in the back half of the draft in the first round that I see splurging on a running back. So a lot of these guys that we're about to talk about here in this first to second round range are mostly, in my opinion, second rounders. I think Brees Hall is a running back that's going to come off the board in the second round. I think Kenneth Walker, the third, is a running back that's going to come off the board in the second round. And I think Isaiah Spiller is a running back that's going to come off the board in the second or early third round. The two wild cards that I felt the need to throw in there were James Cook, a guy I think with his connections to his brother Dalvin. In fact, he's kind of a similar player and what he brings to the passing game in today's modern NFL. I think a guy like James Cook could slide in there. And I think a guy like Brian Robinson Jr., who's just an all-around player, he can do everything. I think he's a guy that a lot of NFL teams could fall in love with because he's plug and play right away. He's ready to go. So Hall, Walker, and Spiller are the guys that I have first or second round grades on or guys I can see going in the first or the second round. Comment section, let me know. Of these three guys here, and I'm going to take this graphic off the screen, uh, of these three guys here, who... Is there anyone that you would be willing to take maybe at 57? Uh, Or who is your running back of these three? And while you guys are letting us know in the comment section, Dave, I'm going to start with you. Like, who's your dude of these three? I mean, of those three, it's Brees Hall. Um, Mm -hmm. Just given his track record, his receiving chops, his three down ability, uh, three down back ability. I mean, not exactly a powerhouse, right? Uh, School he's playing at as far as like being in a position to just like be one of these Bama backs or one of these Oklahoma Mm -hmm. backs that just constantly, you know, puts up numbers. We're talking about, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about Iowa state, right? I mean, it's not exactly a a factory for, for running back production. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was able to do what he did, um, I, I think is impressive. He, to me is the, he, to me is my RB one, um, in this, uh, in this draft. But again, 57, you know, we're talking about like late second round and judge what you're talking about first, second round guys. I I'm with you. Like, I mm-hmm. don't know that there's, if there's a guy that gets picked in the first round, you start looking at like, well, well, who's it going to go to? Like you look at after the bills, the Titans aren't going to pick a running back. Most likely Tampa, probably not green Bay. He's got AJ Dillon, Aaron Jones, Miami. Are they be willing to take a running back when they're trying to build up that, that team around, they added Moser and Edmonds too. Yeah. Exactly. And they added, and then the Chiefs just took Clyde two years ago. Mm-hmm. And the Bengals have Mixon. So um, and then you get back obviously to Detroit picking last, and they've uh, made some investments with DeAndre Swift and so on. So like you you start to wonder, like, is a running back gonna get picked in the first round? So then at 57 in the second round, you're talking about the late second round for the Bills, one of those three guys could very well be there. We know mm-hmm. the value of the running back position hasn't been what it what it's been. I think we we all agree that the top end of this running back class maybe isn't as strong as last yeah. year's with ETN, Najee, and, and Javante. You don't have that trio this year. Your trio, like you put on the on the screen there, mm-hmm. by by most people's accounts, is Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, and uh, and Isaiah Spiller. Which to me, 
is significantly behind as a group versus the three from yeah. last, the top three from last year. So it is a very realistic possibility at 57 that one of those guys is there. And if the bills were to take a swing at a running back and one out of one of those three guys, for me, it would be Brees Hall. If it was mm-hmm. one of those three guys. I'm with you. I have Brees Hall as my RB one. I think he's got three down ability. I think he's got the physical traits to handle uh, being a volume runner in the NFL my comparable, I'm not saying he's the same exact type of player, but like the vibes I get watching Brees Hall play, I envision sort of a Joe Mixon role for him in an NFL offense. And I think that's something the Buffalo Bills could utilize, uh, a Joe Mixon type. Uh, obviously, Kenneth Walker, I'll play devil's advocate here. I don't, I like Kenneth Walker. To me, yep. it's that Spider-Man meme. Kenneth Walker and Javante Williams was my favorite running back last year. They're just pointing at each other, the same guy. I love Kenneth Walker and uh, you just watch that game. He had against Michigan, the five touchdowns he has, you know, five, nine, two, 11 runs at four, three, eight, 40. Uh, he's got an over a nine Raz. Kenneth Walker's got vision, contact balance. Kenneth Walker, you can make an argument is the best running back in the class, but he doesn't have maybe the three down ability that a Brees Hall does, which pushes Brees Hall ahead of Kenneth Walker. Uh, Kendall, your guy is Isaiah Spiller. The comp I have for Isaiah Spiller is Josh Jacobs. What are your thoughts on adding an Isaiah Spiller, who I know is your RB1 to the Buffalo Bills offense? And where do you feel comfortable drafting Isaiah Spiller? Yeah, I'll start with where I feel feel comfortable, and it's it's at 57. I don't feel comfortable drafting any running back in the first round this year. Um, yeah, like like tilt laid out so eloquently it's it's really about the comparison to last year like we were all talking about etn harris in the first round last year and i'm not someone to draw a line in the sand about when to take a running back i think it depends on the player if they're good enough they're worth a first round pick i don't think any of the guys this year are worth a first round pick i just don't think they're good enough for it and i think that's when you're starting to see one, the evaluation process, and two, the positional value. It just doesn't add up to taking any of these three guys that we've talked about in the first round. Mm-hmm. So the reason I took Spiller is because I think, like like you guys say about Brees Hall, I think Isaiah Spiller is also a three-down back, but I think he's better. He's just a notch better in just about every area. He's very well-rounded. I think he's a better pass blocker than Brees Hall, and that, for me, bumped up his grade quite a decent amount. I mean, being on the field on third down, yeah, you have to be a pass catcher, but you can't be a tendency giveaway and you can't be someone that says, oh, you're in the game. You're not going to be pass blocking. We know you're going to be running a route. And Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's what Brees Hall is, but he leans more in that direction than Isaiah Spiller does. I think Spiller has better vision, better contact balance. He's probably not faster than Brees Hall, but speed is everything. It's about how you play the game. And we learned that from Matt Breida this past year. It was a tough pill to swallow, but speed isn't everything at the position. You need a complete back. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, I think here it is. Doesn't Spiller fumble all the time and can't catch a pass? He doesn't have issues necessarily catching passes. He does have small hands, and that contributes to his issues holding onto the football ball security-wise. I think that's a mm-hmm. big thing that he has to work towards at the next level. That's my biggest knock against yeah. Spiller. But um, and yeah, I, I just think he's more well-rounded of a player. Pretty sure and he has more. Uh, game. Pretty sure he has more receptions in college than Kenneth Walker. So yeah, uh, Kenneth Walker <laughs> is the least accomplished of pass catching backs. Yeah. But he's not someone that I'm going to mm. write off as a pass catcher just because he hasn't right. done it. Could have been the Michigan State offense. That's fair. Oh, it was 100 percent the Michigan State yeah. uh, uh, offense there. But uh, shifting our focus now to the third and the fourth rounds. My third round running backs, and, and go, this is again three year averages over the past three years. There's been an average of three running backs taken in the third round and four running backs taken in the fourth round. So these are the running backs that I have projected to go late day two and early day three. I think the third round running backs, James Cook, Brian Robinson Jr., and Tyler Beatty who I like to call Tyler Batty because he's my little Batty. I love <laughs> Tyler Beatty. Those are my third Those are my third round running backs. Let's start with them because I read an article today that says James Cook is a favorite of the Giants. And whenever I'm seeing something that says favorite of the Giants, 
this offseason. I'm assuming uh, that's probably also a favorite of the Bills as well. Based on like Brandon Bean's comment on the Pat McAfee show, like I could see about all the ability of these these running backs to be practically wide receiver and how it's like it's a really nice thing to see. And, and the fact that the Bills are transitioning to this, you know, pass heavy offense, I could see the Buffalo Bills shocking some people and pulling the trigger on James Cook at pick 57. I, I don't even know if guys like Brian Robinson and James Cook will even remotely be there by the time the Bills pick in the third round. I think it's more likely, honestly, that Isaiah Spiller is there in the third round as opposed to Walker Hall. And I think these two guys are going to be rising, and I think the traits are going to get them drafted, uh, or at least the traits are going to get J James Cook drafted, and then uh, Brian Robinson Jr. is going to get drafted just based on his all-around game. I think maybe higher than some people think. Uh, you know, Kendall, I'm going to start with you. James Cook, like, where would you take this dude? My comp for him, a lot of people want to compare him to his brother. Mm -hmm. uh, my comp for him is Brian Westbrook back with the old Philadelphia Eagles offense. I think he's a Brian Westbrook type. Where do you think James Cook gets drafted? And where would you draft him? Um, It's kind of tough because like you said, he is, he, he is, he's a sexy pick. I, I guess that's mm -hmm. the best way to put it. He's a sexy pick. He has that, that speed. You can see it on tape and he ran a four, four, four 40. So, you know, he's fast translating from the 40 and onto the field. He has that pass catching ability. Um, but my my biggest concern is just like how he's going to hold up in between the tackles long term. Uh, he's only 190 pounds, but he showed on tape that he can bang with guys in the middle. Mm -hmm. Not his forte by any means, but it is something he can do. Um, a big thing with him, though, and why I think he fits the bills. But a, a reason that he may slip is a lot of his runs at Georgia came from shotgun formations. He runs uh he runs out of spread formations from the shotgun zone runs. Does that fit what the Bills may be trending towards? Sure, but it may slide down some boards on some other teams because he doesn't run from the traditional single back or I formation where the quarterback is under center and that kind of limits mm -hmm. his I guess what he's comfortable with. Um, do I have doubts about his game? Sure. In some areas I, I doubt, um, I question his pass blocking ability and how strong he'll be at the point of attack, picking up linebackers and stuff like that. But I think there's a lot of intrigue when it comes to his game and I would have no problem taking him in third round. I think the second round is too rich for me, but it wouldn't shock me if he does go up there. Like you said, because of those, mm -hmm. those sexy traits, I, I think it's possible but for my money, I, I wouldn't do it before, uh, what is it, 89 for us? Yeah, 89. And, and, and Kendall, just one more to you because Silas Whittle says, man, give me uh, – oh, uh, John DeFazio comes in says James Cook would be a steal rounds two to three. I can see a lot of teams thinking that, and, and that's why he sort of gets drafted. Exactly. Silas Whittle comes in and says, man, uh, you know, give me Brian Robinson. He's patient when running. He's an excellent pass blocker. We were texting back and forth all afternoon about comps, and – uh, oh, the comp that we sort of like settled on, it's a little flamethrower language here in Bill's Mafia, yeah, but a little bit. I, I'll tell you what, like you were spot on, like Brian Robinson kind of has a little Fred Jackson to his game where maybe he's not perfect at anything. Like he's not elite at anything, but he's just, he's a good pass catcher. He's good between the tackles. He's good on outside runs. He's good pass protection. Like he just does everything well. He's a smart, heady player, and NFL executives are going to say, this is a plug-and-play guy who is just of an absolute value to me, and they're going to draft him early because they think he can be just a competent back for him. And as much as I want to comp him to Fred Jackson, when he gets north and south, he's got like a little Chris Carson to his game. He's not afraid mm -hmm. to lower the pads and lower the boom and, and yes. pop on some people. So Brian Robinson Jr. is a name that I think a lot of people are like, well, he's a fourth or, four, fourth or fifth. No, is this guy could be a, a legit early third round draft pick uh, that I think the Buffalo Bills could take into Brian Robinson Jr. You say you're higher on him than most. Uh, what are your thoughts on Brian Robinson Jr., Kendall? I mean, it's a lot of the things you said. It's about being pro ready right now, and he shows that. He shows that a ton. Um, I think an appealing thing about him is 
he got some run with Alabama while they had good running backs. He's played for Mm -hmm. them for five years. He's not someone who's, you know, his tires are falling off because he literally didn't get that bell cow role until this year. But Mm -hmm. when he got it, he got it and ran with it. Like you said, very well-rounded game. There really isn't a hole in his game outside of like long speed, but Fred Jackson didn't have long speed. If you have good enough Mm -hmm. like contact balance, contact balance is probably the most important trait for a running back, and he possesses it. If you bounce off of tackles, that's what counts. You don't necessarily need to run away from tackles. If you can run through them and stay upright, that's very valuable. He can do that pretty well. The biggest issue is he's six foot one, Mm -hmm. and when you're that tall, it, it does kind of hinder your ability to stay upright sometimes. So it depends on where the contact is being initiated with him. He started off as like running back eight for me. The more film I watched, he's all the way up to RB three for me. I I'm super high on him. I don't think he's going to be someone that has like an amazing, illustrious career, but I think he's going to have a long Mm -hmm. career and a really nice, solid career. So yeah, that being pro ready right now, I I agree with you. I think it's going to get him drafted earlier Mm -hmm. than people think. He's literally the antithesis to James Cook. He's not the sexy pick, but he's going to do the dirty work for you, and he's going to get the yards out of there. Dave, you have it. You're sitting there at 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 uh, you're sitting there, and you have an opportunity to trade up because I, I I think I don't think you think any of these guys are going to be available for us in the third round, late in the third round. You're sitting there, and you're Brandon Bean. You get a phone call, and someone's offering you, hey, a third and a six, or a third and a fifth, whatever it is, to trade up into the beginning of the third round. And you know that both James Cook and Brian Robinson Jr. are going to be on the board. Who are you taking? Who are you taking? Wow. Um, you know, if I'm Brandon Bean and I'm thinking ahead beyond 2022, I'm probably taking Brian mm-hmm. Robinson because now all of a sudden I also have a contingency plan of Devin Singletary is not in the mix beyond 2022, and the Bills want to churn and burn through the running back room. Now, I'm not saying they should do that or they will, but. Brian Robinson gives you the option to potentially have, you know, your RB one a in waiting. If you wanted to go that route mm-hmm. and to Kendall's point, I don't know that James cook is that guy. Now I think he's stouter uh, and thicker in the legs than people maybe realize mm-hmm. um, when you look mm-hmm. at him compared to his brother, he actually, he, he, his legs look a lot thicker than Dalvin's. So when you watch him run, you can kind of yeah. see that stoutness in James, but mm-hmm. uh, I would say Brian Robinson would be the guy. Um, but I'd say wild card pick in there would be my guy, Rashad white potentially mm-hmm. um, in the third round, or if you really wanted to secure his services yeah. and move up in the third Um Look, you probably can get him with your third round pick. I'm not going to lie. But right now, Rashad White is my RB5 mm-hmm. in this draft, um, right behind Brian Robinson. And I actually have James Cook six. So Rashad White to me is the guy that super smooth as a receiver. He's got mm-hmm. the size, he's got the patience. I think Rashad White is the guy, like Kendall was saying, you don't give away your tendency with him in the game. Mm-hmm. Much like Brian Robinson, when by the way, Brian Robinson, when he finally did become the Belkow, added 35 receptions in 2021. Yeah. By the way, so he's capable. Rashad White over 40 receptions in 2021 mm-hmm. really only played, uh, you know, kind of two seasons. Rashad White for, for Arizona State. So let's not discount him as a possible option there in the third round as a guy who wouldn't be a tendency giveaway either. Um, given his chops. So I had to throw in my guy there who sneaks into my top five running back rankings, uh, mm. Rashad White. Yeah, I mean, with, without a doubt, like I said, this is not our rankings. You have obviously Rashad White higher. This is this is my sort of projection of where I think yeah, guys no, are going to go fair. based on, on what I'm seeing. And that's yeah, I, I, I honestly like the Bills are picking at the back half of every round. And I think Rashad White is, an, er, Rashad White is like an early fourth rounder. Right. So he might be a guy who's in play in the third round, despite the fact that maybe there's a a fourth round grade on a guy like Rashad White. My guy has been and will be throughout the duration. I love Rashad White. My guy is Tyler Beatty. I think he's one of the most slept on running backs in this class. I think he gets massively disrespected because of his size, five foot eight, 197. But he ran that four, four, five, 40. To me, you're adding a Michael Carter to this offense. You guys like Michael Carter, right? From the New York Jets. 
you're adding a Michael Carter to this offense. I think when you add a Tyler Beatty, that type of skill set, a guy who is just absolutely criminally underrated the things that he did at the University of Missouri. You're adding a guy with turbos into this offense, a guy who can make the big plays, a guy who can maybe help you implement a screen game, a guy who could be a receiver out of the backfield, a guy who can give you some uh, some 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 options on those outside zone runs. Tyler Beatty, to me, is that guy. All right, Judge, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot. Third round comes along, right? Yeah. Bills don't trade out. They're pick 89, and James Cook and – Tyler Beatty are on the board. I take James Cook. I have okay. James Cook higher. So okay. I have James Cook higher. Uh, I have James Cook as my as my fourth running back, and I have Tyler Beatty as my sixth running back. Okay. That's um, so I do have Tyler Beatty over Rashad White, um, but I would take James Cook over Tyler Beatty. Uh, but I still do think that in terms of value, you can get Tyler Beatty. You might even Tyler Beatty could even slip because of the size and be had in the fourth round. And I would I would jump all over Tyler Beatty in the fourth round. Some other people that we have as possible fourth round options, Damian Pierce, who was just mentioned in this super chat uh, from Eric Farrell. Um, you know, what do you guys think of Damian Pierce? He had a good senior bowl. He was the talk of the senior bowl, but then he had a rough combine. So that's going to be sort of the question is how much do you value the combine numbers for a guy like Damian Pierce? The Buffalo Bills did talk to him at least a little bit at the senior bowl. Uh, you have some other guys there in the fourth round jerome ford from cincinnati kyrene williams from notre dame who also had just an awful combine just and terrible. zamir white from georgia who had a great combine uh i'm going to share my comparables here for these fourth round guys rashad white gives me you know chase Edmonds vibes uh damian pierce gives me like sort of cj anderson type of vibes uh if you guys remember cj anderson the former bronco from back in the day Jerome Ford sort of reminds me a little bit of Sony Michelle. I think Kyrene Williams is pretty much as close to JD McKissick, the guy who spurned us as you're going to get in this draft class. Uh, and then Zamir White to me is sort of like a Damian Harris of the New England Patriots type where he's not the flashiest in the world, but he can work between the tackles. Uh, and he tested out relatively well at the combine, which I he think did. will he help, did have a good his, combine. Yeah. Will help his yeah. stock immensely. Um I like Kyrene Williams fourth round and later as sort of that McKissick type of replacement, depending on what we do early. Obviously he's not the flashiest athlete. I, I, I don't know about a guy like Zamir white. Cause I think I am looking for a compliment to Singletary more than a replacement of Singletary, but any of those like Kendall, maybe talk about Damian Pierce a little bit and what people are getting in, in a Damian Pierce. And would the bills really have an interest in a guy who tested so poorly after drafting guys like Devin Singletary and Zach Moss who tested poorly? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. What I what I want to circle back to, um, obviously this is anecdotal. I mm -hmm. personally would put Beatty as a fourth round projection and bump Ford and White into the third round and have okay. four guys in the third round, and then I think it's five in the fourth round. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of Damian Pierce, I think you're absolutely right. I think he's a good player and he's a very intriguing player for the right team. I don't think that team is the Bills. I was expecting him to test better. He plays really well on tape. He had a great senior bowl, like you said. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really make sense for the Bills, especially with what we know is going on uh, with what they're valuing, like traits wise mm -hmm. from, a, from a running back. It's kind of like why we're talking about James Cook. It's why we're talking about Tyler Beatty. It's why we're talking about Rashad White. These guys that bring that passing game impact, Damian Pierce can pass block really well, and yeah. he can add some. He actually had some really nice reps running routes and catching the football at the Senior Bowl, but he didn't get a lot of run at it mm -hmm. um, at Florida. And then when you don't test that well, you're starting to think about a guy who's a Zach Moss replacement. We talked about it earlier in this show. We're not all that convinced that they're just going to move on from Zach Moss. Mm -hmm. I mean – would all of us probably prefer that and maybe try and recoup some draft picks for him? Sure. But we're giving Cody Ford a chance. Like you said, Till. Yeah. why are we going to assume that they're not going to give that same no, chance? Zach Moss is going to be on the team. Most, I mean, I'm a bit like 90% sure he's going to be on. He'll at least be a exactly. training game. He'll at least be a yeah. training game. Yeah. So the thing with Damian Pierce is he's a really intriguing runner because he runs violently, super tough, that competitive toughness, just oozes out of him every single play. If anyone has seen the touchdown that he had got called back because he wasn't wearing a helmet and he lost his helmet mid play. Like that says everything about <laughs> his running style 
the dude runs angry and he runs hard for every single yard. So mm-hmm. I love that about him, but I think it's redundant. And I think if he's drafted, it means something about Zach Moss. Silas Whittle came in with a super chat earlier. I had up on the screen. He talks about his love for Ty Tandler, Devontae Price yeah. later on. There, yeah. I have some guys late in this draft and we're going to get to them that I adore. And I would absolutely love if we just waited till the fifth or the sixth round to pull the trigger on a running back. I would love it. Mm-hmm. But I think that the, the, the option is still open because the bills have filled so many holes that they, and there are some intriguing running backs that really could fit this offense. I think there is a chance the bills could pull the trigger earlier uh, than that on a running back. So let's get to the fifth round now. And mm. it's going to seem light. I only have three players, but that's because the last three years, the average number of running backs taken in the fifth round uh, has been two running backs two, yeah. two. So I have three running backs on my fifth round board here. And these are three that are really growing on me. Mm. Number one is Hassan Haskins. I think, Kendall, you have a love for Hassan Haskins. I have a love for Hassan Haskins. I didn't really think he was a fit for the Bills. But the more I watch him, the more I just, I mean, this guy is like, he is a demon on special teams. He's a four-faced special Mm -hmm. teamer. Not as a returner, but like as a guy who goes down and tackles. He just lays the lumber on people like he's a freaking linebacker. Um, And he plays on those special teams unit. He pass blocks like that. Um, And he's just such a smooth runner. I really do like Hassan Haskins. I was talking to you guys before the show. If you like Alexander Madison from the Minnesota Vikings and you're like, man, I wish Alexander Madison, uh, you know, wasn't uh, sitting behind Dalvin Cook. Hassan Haskins is your dude in this draft. Like, I think that they profile in a very similar manner. I really like Hassan Haskins as this year's like sort of Alexander Madison type. I hope he gets drafted into a situation where he actually gets to play. Uh, That would be nice. Um, Combine darling guy who blew up the East West Shrine Bowl, Pierre Strong. I think he could be this year's Elijah Mitchell and his testing numbers and his size comparables line up very favorably with a guy like Elijah Mitchell. So Pierre Strong Jr. out of South Dakota State is a really interesting running back. And a guy that many people thought was a could be could transition to slot receiver. And I get a lot of Chase Edmonds vibes from this guy. It's Tyler Goodson from the University of Iowa. These are the three guys that I have slotted in as possibly guys in the fifth round. Anyone stick out to you of those three, Dave, that you would be like, all right, I would jump all over that in fifth round. I mean, it's funny you have those guys because, like, you didn't show me this graphic before the show, and, like, mm-hmm. they're two, two of the three I had circled, and Haskins is another one that I just – I liked, but I kind of didn't really see the immediate sort of path for him to the Bills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's why I kind of, like, dismissed him slightly, but I don't dismiss him as a player. I really like him. Um, the thing that stands out to me about Haskins is just his nose for the end zone. I mean, when he gets mm-hmm. – when you're, when you're inside the five-yard line, yeah. on the goal line and I'm I'm probably selling him short on, on the rest of his game but like one of the best goal line backs I've seen in the country um in 2021 I mean the guy just has a nose for the end zone so if you're worried about guys like Zach Moss running into their own men on the <laughs> on running into their own <laughs> linemen on the goal line you're not going to have that problem with Hassan Haskins that guy will find the tiniest crease and he will make that yard for you as far as Goodson strong like you mentioned strong had the 9.76 raz would be a good fit in his own scheme um would be a nice compliment to a guy like Devin Singletary I think but Goodson is the guy that's been kind of growing on me more so than almost anyone um the receiving ability is just like off the charts from Goodson mm-hmm. right he's a complete back he does I think Kendall would probably can correct me on this but like as good as he is as a receiving back he he's average i would say in pass protection so you do wonder mm-hmm. about that he's not going to be the level of like a jd mckissick in a pa- in pass protection as your third down back something mm-hmm. that you would need to work on but the the ball of clay there as a receiving back yep um is absolutely there with tyler goodson and, and ran well at the combine as well so if you go back and you look at his combine numbers i had it uh i just had it up right here um 442 40 so plenty of speed enough speed to get you by and um really the coaching him up is is really going to be mostly on i think on the pass protection because you know he's going to give you everything that you need as a receiver so i like both of these guys i mm-hmm. do they do something a little different all three of these guys do something a little different if i was going to kind of put my you know flag in the ground for one of the three as like a fit for the bills it would probably be goodson 
mm -hmm. the three. Um, but I wouldn't be upset with any of them, really. Yeah. I think if it's Haskins, then it's a clear sign to Zach Moss as far Brighton. as like yep. yeah, as him being on the outs. Um, Michael Bell says, I love it on what is RAS. It's it stands for relative athletic score, mm -hmm. basically measures um the different drills and height, weight, different things of the prospects and kind of compares them to essentially the history of other players that have mm -hmm. um gotten times or yeah. or jumps or or you know all that stuff and kind of puts them in a percentile essentially and gives them a score yeah out of um, 10 so the closer you are to 10, 10 it, it, it is what it's saying like the better athlete you are so if someone's got like a one or two raz probably not the greatest athlete kyron williams one point something <laughs> raz. yeah not a great raz. Hey, still better than, seven, uh, six raz <laughs> i think that's still better than devin singletary's raz yeah oh God. i think tim settles raz was like like 1.57 so did like you guys see that raz is sorry, not this, is, this is a tangent but sorry did you guys see that jordan davis's raz was better oh, as a cornerback than darion kendrick, kendrick yes <laughs> as a cornerback so. as a cornerback <laughs> darion kendrick is doing himself no favors in this oh, redraft process um take, so here's the money round round number six and and people in the comment section again if you feel like i got people in the wrong place feel free to let us know if you like a guy feel free to let us know uh let us know your thoughts on certain players as we go through the rounds here round six is my money round uh i like every single one of these guys and i like <laughs> them a lot uh here are my round six running back prospects i got isaiah pacheco from rutgers who's been a riser in sort of the pre-draft process, had a really good combine. People are going back to Rutgers, watching the tape, liking what they see. Quan White was a late invite to the Senior Bowl. Um, you know, as Randy Hardman was saying in the comment section, a guy that was probably underutilized at South Carolina and also behind Kevin Harris. Um, so a guy that's sort of like a receiving type of third down back. Uh, Jay Sean Corbin, I think is one of the biggest sleepers in this class. Really yeah. good in pass protection. I think he's a really good zone runner. He had a really good East-West Shrine game. Pierre Strong, Jay Sean Corbin, and Ty Chandler blew up the East-West Shrine Bowl. I mean, just absolutely to smithereens. I'm, I was crushing hard on all three after watching a week of the East-West Shrine. Uh, Abram Smith, who had a good senior bowl, former linebacker. I mean, when I say former linebacker, I mean like two years ago, he was a starting linebacker at Baylor and had like 100 plus tackles. Um, so Abram Smith. I think Bill's Mafia darlings here, the last two, Ty Chandler out of North Carolina, Max Borgie out of Washington State. If I'm looking for comparables here for all of these guys, I had for Isaiah Pacheco, I had Tevin Coleman as sort of a comparable or like sort of a relative athlete. For Quan White, I had Kenyon Drake as sort of possibly a comparable athlete. For Jay Sean Corbin, I probably went a little out of left field here because I really like Jay Sean. I put Aaron Jones size and athletically he's comparable to an Aaron. Aaron Jones, if you look at his NFL draft profile, it said may need to play in a developmental league. That was on the scouting report <laughs> on NFL.com for Aaron Jones. So when I compare a guy like Jay Sean Corbin to an Aaron Jones, it's not out of this world crazy. Just goes to um, show you, man, even the so-called experts are wrong. Abram Smith. Time. He showed a little bit of passing uh, ability, a pass catching ability at the senior bowl, something he wasn't asked to do at Baylor because they had trust in Ebner. My comp here is Chris Ivory, former Buffalo Bill. Ty Chandler, my comp for Ty Chandler. I really like this one, Miles Gaskin. Uh, that is my comp for, for Ty Chandler. And for Max Borgie, I think it's pretty simple. He's a Rex Burkhead comp, uh, maybe a little bit quicker than Rex Burkhead, but he's sort of a third down back type, um, a guy who gives you a little bit of pop as a receiver and, a, and, a, and pass locker. So, those are my running backs in the sixth round. Dave, I'm going to start with you. You know, who, who's your guy here in the sixth round? Because there's a plethora of guys to choose from here. Uh, Chandler's my guy. I mean, he's been a guy that I've talked about for a long time now. I think he could be a poor man's three down running back if you really wanted to find a guy late in the draft that potentially gives mm -hmm. you three down option. I think that his short area burst, uh, really stands out to me. I think the long speed is what you wonder about, but he did test well at the combine for me. I'd actually probably slide Chandler into that fifth round group uh, to just mm -hmm. even it out a little bit, but you're right, judge. I mean, as far as the numbers game, chances are there's only going to be two, maybe three running backs picked in the fifth mm -hmm. round based on the law of averages. But I could see a guy like uh, I could see a guy like Ty Chandler making, um, making up some ground there and going up to the fifth. He would be the guy for me. Um, Someone asked me on Twitter today if I had my choice between him 
uh, or Bam Knight, who obviously tugs at my heartstrings being mm. from NC State. <laughs> and look, I love Bam Knight. I love what he offers. I love that he can do kick returns, but he doesn't do punt returns. And Ty Chandler, to me, is a better running back. So if you're going to find your return man elsewhere, to me, it's Ty Chandler of that group, and he'd be the guy that I'd probably plant my flag in the ground for if the Bills were going to use one of their sixth-round picks on a running back. I'd be very, very happy um, with them putting uh, putting that pick in Ty Chandler. Kendall, how about you? You got a, a plethora of, of guys to choose from here. I'm guessing – that you're going to go with Max Borgie here, but well, who's your, who are you planting the flag for of these six round guys? I know talk um, about Pacheco a little bit too. Cause I, I do you, I, I know you did a lot of uh, scouting on Pacheco. What did you say your comp was for Pacheco? I I'm already forgetting. Tevin Coleman. All right. That's not bad. I, I think that makes sense. I think and it's runs more of a little, an, it's more of an athletic comparison. Yeah. 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 Size, speed, et cetera. More so than I see maybe, that. Yeah. yeah the so, running style is like just probably slightly off because mm -hmm. Coleman's more of like that that outside zone runner Pacheco's probably more in between the tackles, like toughness type of runner, yeah. but you do see that competitive toughness in how Coleman runs. So I think there is a comparable um, sim similarity there. Uh, I guess I'll start with Pacheco, but that's not my guy. Uh, so Pacheco is a really tough runner. Doesn't play super, super fast on tape, but plays fast enough where he can run from people and challenge pursuit angles. Uh, he's capable of developing into a three down back. He's not great as a pass catcher, but you can see there's potential there. Solid run blocker. Like I said, he's good in between the tackles and very tough as a runner, uh, sufficient elusiveness. Like he can make people mm -hmm. miss, but he needs more space to do it than most. Uh, but you can definitely see the power and the toughness in the way he runs. I've said toughness like five times while talking about him. <laughs> like that, that's just, that's just what I think about when I think about Isaiah Pacheco. So kind of that. I guess that Zach Moss replacement with a little bit more juice, I guess is what you would be getting from mm -hmm. Pacheco. So I think there's intrigue there, especially if we wait till the sixth round, but yeah, my guy is Borgie. I really like Max Borgie. I think it's really hard to literally like look at him in the face and not think of Chris, Christian McCaffrey. They literally mm -hmm. look like twins. It's kind of nuts. Um, they're, they're not, I'm not comparing one to the other or he is not Christian. <laughs> Just McCaffrey, on looks. But just looks and like play style. Sure. But like play capability in That Washington state there. Jersey. He looked a lot like Christian McCaffrey in a Stanford Jersey. It, it is yes. really crazy how similar, <laughs> like the, all the looks of it goes into, but no, he doesn't play to that level, but the play style is very similar. Pass catch, uh, pass catching heavy type of back, really good at threatening the edges of defense mm -hmm. on swing routes, screens, outside zones, stuff like that. Uh, he's kind of stiff as a runner, which is really where I have the most pause with him. Like as a pure running back, he's got a lot of room to grow. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem comfortable running between the tackles. Stop me if you've heard this before. He really likes to bounce it outside, and that that <laughs> really gives me some cause for concern. But mm -hmm. there there's something to work with there. He's got great speed and really good toughness in contact balance. For yeah. someone, he looks to be on the smaller side, but I think he's like 5'10", like or yeah, 5'10", like 210 pounds, something like that. He's kind of thick. So mm -hmm. he runs fast and he's got a big enough body to hold up in, at the next level, but he almost seems afraid of contact, which is kind of sketchy for me, but it's something you can work with. Definitely merits a sixth round pick. I don't think I would go any earlier than that, but it's an intriguing mm -hmm. type of guy, especially fitting the mold of someone who could compete with Duke Johnson this preseason. And uh, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and close off the sixth round. This is for Casey Reed, our, uh, our, our, our friend of the pod, friend of the show, Florida State guy, Jay Sean Corbin. Um, he actually lost like 15 pounds in the pre-draft process, down from like 220 to 220 to about like 205-ish. Um, but I mean, you mentioned like bouncing to the outside. Jay Sean Corbin does not bounce to the outside. This is no. a guy who is not afraid one cut and north-south. Mm -hmm. And Jason Corbin has some really good burst when he goes north south. Um, you know, he's really good uh, at, at getting north south and just finding that lane and taking it um, and, you know, taking the yards that are given to him going north and south. He's really good in pass protection. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of the things that I'm, uh, I'm reading about him say, like, he's got the ability to be a pass catcher. He just hasn't been utilized because he's such a good pass blocker. So mm -hmm. a guy like Jason Corbin late could be a real steal. 
Pops Mafia said he should have went back to school. I don't disagree with you there. I think the shelf life for a running back is rather short. Um, and I think what he showed at the East West Shrine game is going to get him drafted. Uh, so I think Jay Sean Corbin uh, is going to go fifth, sixth round because of what he did. That I mean, like I said, him, Strong, and Ty Chandler just put on a show all week at the East West Shrine. Like they were uh, them, Kyle Phillips, they were the talk of the town at the East West Shrine. Um, on to the seventh round now. Looking over some of these running backs that I have a seventh round grade on. Sincere McCormick, a lot of people's favorite from UTSA. Tyler Algier from BYU. Devontae Price from Florida International. Dave's guy, Bam Knight from North Carolina State. You got Ty Davis Price from LSU, another guy who probably should have stood in school. Uh, and then Keontae Ingram from USC, who had a really big um, you know, NFL PA Bowl week. Uh, so he had a really good week there at the NFL PA Bowl. Uh, looking at these guys, my comparables, um, you know, for who is the first one up here? Sincere McCormick. I don't have a comparable for Sincere McCormick, but uh, Tyler Algier. I went with Zach Moss, which people are not going to like. Uh, Devontae Price is another guy that I thought reminded me a little bit of Tevin Coleman. So I got a Tevin Coleman athletic comp on Devontae Price. Bam Knight. I'm really proud of this comp. I went with Khalil Herbert. I think he reminds me a lot of Khalil Herbert because he's got kick return flex. Bam Knight is a guy who's housed multiple kick returns for NC State in his time there. Uh, Ty Davis Price, I don't. I got DJ Dallas as an athletic comp, and I don't have anyone as an athletic comp for a Keontae Ingram, but I know that a lot of NFL scouts have really been high on Keontae Ingram in this pre-draft process. Felt like he was underutilized at USC. So, um, you know, Dave, I think you're going to go to Bam Knight. So can almost start with you. Uh, and let you pick someone not named Bam Knight here on this list. I know you've done a, a number of uh, scouting on Tyler Algier. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you went to me first because Tyler Algier is like literally the only one I could talk about. <laughs> um, no, I could talk about McCormick, but I'd kind of be talking out of my ass. So I'm I'm good. I'm good talking about Algier. I think the thing with Algier is definitely the fact that he's going to be mm -hmm. that that Zach Moss replacement. I'm actually shocked you have him as a projection for seventh round. Uh, combine and 40 time definitely didn't help him, especially with the hype that he was apparently going to run a four, four 40 and he ran a four, six 40. So that definitely didn't help him. Um, but if you're looking for a Zach Moss replacement, this guy will do that. He's got a little bit more juice. Uh, he can run away from people. Like I said, with uh, Pacheco, he can threaten pursuit angles, not necessarily destroy them, but he can threaten them. Very tough runner. He's one cut downhill. Uh, kind of similar to um, Damian Pierce. He's looking for contact and he's going to be a violent runner. Plays with pretty good contact balance too. Always fighting for yards, fighting for those extra yards. And the nice part about Algier is that he's also pretty solid as a passing game impact type of running mm -hmm. back. He's good in pass protection. He's shown that he can catch those flare routes out of the backfield. Struggles a little bit on some concentration drops, trying to, you know, get the yards after the catch before he's even mm -hmm. caught the ball. But I mean, that's something you can work with. That's not something to write someone off about, but it is somewhat concerning. Um, I think my biggest concern with him is a lot of his big plays came against really light boxes. Um, so like five man, six man boxes where it's like really wide alignments mm -hmm. from the defensive front, stuff like that, where it's really obvious glaring holes that he has to run through. It makes me question his vision just a little bit, but someone who's going to be tough and violent at the point of attack and fight for extra yards. Vision isn't everything because they're going to be churning out like maybe an extra two or three after mm -hmm. contact anyways. But vision is still a very important qualities for running back. So it is a reason why he dropped down a little bit for me. He's my RB 13. So I don't have him going in the seventh round, but <laughs> I definitely understand the concerns for him. Yeah. Uh, like I've noted with him, there, mm -hmm. there are concerns. There are reasons that he could drop later into day three, but I'd be shocked if he doesn't, yeah. if he makes I, it out of round six. And that goes to show you how crazy that he's my RB. Yes. 20, he's my RB 22. So yeah. uh, it just goes to show you like this draft. I mean, it's, it's chock full uh, of running backs and, and, and it's so tough when you're, when you're slotting running backs too. Cause it's like, pick your poison. Like, yes, sometimes you want to tend to put like the all purpose back ahead of guys, but then you're like, but I love this guy's niche. So I want to put this mm -hmm. guy ahead because and it's just so absolutely tough slotting running backs. Mm -hmm. um, I had such a tough time doing it when I when I when I've been working through my board here. But Dave, looking at some of these guys that I have projected as seventh round picks, 
who is maybe your guy there? Bam Knight obviously sticks out like a sore thumb there. Yeah, I mean, Keontae Ingram tested well, obviously. He had the big Raz mm -hmm. score, so you feel like he's got um, some potential. Obviously, has the pedigree, uh, you know, coming from USC with the factory of running backs they've put out over the years. But Bam Knight is the guy for me. I mean, I want to... I want to take you guys down a little trip of uh, of memory lane here. <laughs> um, there was a guy who looked a little bit undersized coming out of NC State um, about seven, eight years ago. Let me get specific here. Uh, yeah, 2017, right? So five years ago was his last year at NC State. And, uh, you know, had very limited experience doing punt returns until his very last year at NC State. Um, but was a primary kick returner and had a very kind of similar trajectory to a guy like Bam Knight. And that was Naheem Hines um, and ended up coming to the Colts, covered out a really nice role for himself, became a very good punt returner and kick returner for the Indianapolis Colts with very limited punt return experience in college. Bam Knight's a little thicker, about 10, 10 or so pounds heavier, but height about the same and absolutely electric kick returner. So you have some upside there with a guy like Bam Knight, who, you know, is a little thicker than Hines, probably can offer you a little bit more in the running game. But we've seen Naheem Hines when he's had the chance to run the ball, and the Colts have used him in that fashion. When Jonathan Taylor is not just destroying people, he's been very good as a player in the NFL. And I feel like Bam Knight has the potential mm -hmm. to be on a similar trajectory. Now, Naheem Hines was a fourth round pick. I'm not saying that Bam Knight's going to be a fourth round pick, but I'm saying like, if you're looking for like a Naheem Hines light type player uh, from that school, from NC state, um, who's had a pretty decent record of putting guys into the NFL, um, go back and look at the history of NC state, putting guys in the NFL. They're a top 20, 25 program and putting guys into the NFL in the last 10 or so years. Why not Bam Knight if you want to add some juice on your kick return game and potentially give yourself a a running back who's going to offer you some something on third downs and and a little bit between the tackles and might not be 100% a tendency giveaway if he's in the game because he can offer you ability on the ground as well at least 745 rushing yards in three straight seasons for the Wolfpack so he can get it done zone guy very much a zone guy NC State runs that zone scheme with the best of them and I think would be a great fit in the seventh round. Now, again, am I biased? Of course I am, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I still love Bam Knight. And I think that, you know, we haven't really talked a lot about running backs that have return ability as far as what we've discussed tonight. And mm -hmm. he's one of the few that does. So if you're looking, maybe you don't go with a re wide receiver for whatever reason, or you don't find a corner that has return ability, you do get some of that with Bam Knight. So that's my guy. I'll always, I'll always ride with him. All right. Um, let's see. Did I, I'm telling you what the fourth round guys, uh, <laughs> there Devonte price. I kind of like him. He's got some decent long speed there. Someone mentioned earlier, Ty Davis price got really solid sec production. He's sort of a short, uh, stout squatty type of runner. And then Keontae uh, Ingram's got that athleticism. So UDFAs to round things out here. Uh, we'll go back to what we started with. I mean, there are some steals here. Talk about kick and punt return ability. Trusted Ebner was a kick and punt returner. He was their specialist at Baylor. Uh, Kevin Harris is a is an uber uh, athletic running back who is probably, you can make the argument, maybe a little underused at South Carolina. I really like Jerry on Ely. He gives me like those Chris Thompson vibes. Um, Kennedy Brooks had himself a really good bowl game. I think a lot of people like the vision, the contact balance from Kennedy Brooks. He's got an injury history. Cameron Harris from Miami checks a lot of boxes. Ronnie Rivers from Fresno State probably should have stayed in school. Didn't do it. Letty Brown from West Virginia has quite a number of fans. TJ Pleasure from Utah is a guy who he, he gets hit. He doesn't go down. He makes things happen. CJ Verdell, another guy with injury history who's had some big plays at the University of Oregon over the years. I know Shermani Jones for his size has a lot of fanfare. I really like Stephen Carr, formerly of USC, played for Indiana. I think he's a developmental, you know, third down back type of guy who can catch some passes out of the backfield, um, you know, kick it to the outside as a runner. So, um, you know, just a bunch of options there, uh, a bunch of options there that I think are going to be UDFAs. Because like I said, again, 
The average number of running backs drafted over the last three years is 20. The average number of running backs drafted um, over the last five years is 21. <laughs> like there are, I didn't even mention Calvin Turner either. I think I forgot to put him on the graphic. Calvin Turner from Hawaii, uh, another crazy type of playmaker type of guy. There's like 40 running backs in this class that I mm. really uh, like. And I would justify using at least like a seventh round draft pick on 15 of them aren't going to get drafted. Like it's, um, you know, maybe possibly even more than that aren't going to get drafted. So it's going to be absolutely crazy. All it takes is one GM to fall in love with the guy for them to go two rounds earlier than everyone thought they would go. We see it, it every seems, year at every position. It seems to me, and you guys got me thinking, and I, I changed my opinion on this and I'm willing to change my opinion when it's warranted the top three we talked about not as good this year as last year but mm -hmm. the overall class i think top so to bottom better. is deeper yeah. and mm -hmm. like you said there are going to be 15 guys not drafted that could have been drafted and there are going to be 15 guys drafted that you could have said maybe would have been udfas right so it's like you just don't know and like what you were saying steve like you tend to put the third down three down guys ahead but like it comes down to team need right in most of mm -hmm. these cases is like yep. what does that team need We've been talking about a lot of passing down backs. So the Bills value a passing down back higher than they would a potential three down workhorse. Maybe not so much early in the draft, but like when it comes to a guy like Ty Chandler, who could be like a quote watered down three down back or a guy who's got like really good receiving chops. And that's really all they do. They yeah. could go the route of going for the guy mm -hmm. who's got the better receiving chops. So it's very interesting. The whole running back thing's fascinating to me with like, the averages. I'm really glad you did that, Steve, by the way, because it kind of puts things into perspective when you start yeah. kind of putting mm -hmm. these boards together. And, and pretty much essentially what I did was I, I went through TDN's projection board. I looked over PFN's projection board. Um, I had a little bit of my own flair to it just based on like guys. I think like, I, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not, I'm gonna pat myself on the back. There have been a number of players the past couple of years where I've been like, that's not a seventh round pick. I don't give a shit what anyone tells me. That's a fourth round pick. And they've gone in the fourth round or the third round. I've called a number of those dudes over the past years. I'm proud of it. It's my your it's my biggest one, claim to fame though one has skill. to be Titus Howard, though, right? I mean, is that uh Titus Howard in the first round is something I called like two months before anyone else did. Um yeah, that was Jalen Hurd didn't really work out, but hey, he went <laughs> we did call it. Um, <laughs> I called Deontay Johnson, I called Jalen Darden, like I called a lot of these dudes as third, fourth. It's mostly receiver. I'm pretty good at picking out the receiver. It's gonna go early, but um <laughs> You know, looking at the guys in this draft, I think James Cook is going to go higher than people think. Yep. I think James Cook is going to go way higher than people think. Um, I think Pierre Strong might go higher than people think. I think he's a guy that guys might fall in love with. Um, I think Jay Sean Corbin and Ty Chandler based on, I think all three East West Shrine Ty guys. Ty Chandler is going to go higher than people think, I think. I think all three East West Shrine guys. Randy, I want to say Quan White here from South Carolina goes earlier than people think. But as Randy mentioned in the comment section, ankle injury at the Senior Bowl hasn't been able to, like, I feel like if he was doing some of the drills and things and such, I think Quan, uh, I think Quan uh, White is a Quandre White is a guy we'd be talking about maybe going higher than people think. So I think Rashad White maybe goes higher than people think third round, maybe. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. I'm struggling to find a guy. I think Jerome Ford goes later than people think. I think, Jerome I think Ford he's going to go earlier. I know you yeah, said, I know yeah. till you said that he doesn't do it for you. He just and doesn't do it for there's me. There's no – I, I completely understand that. He's pretty boring, but he checks a lot of boxes in a boring way, yeah. kind of similar to Hassan Haskins. Mm -hmm. Like every time you think he's just a boring back, yeah. he does give me Hassan something Haskins the right in, way. The, in the fifth or sixth mm -hmm. rather than uh, Jerome Ford. <laughs> and <laughs> Mr. Diggs says, was Gabe Davis on Judge's radar? No, and I failed, and I will <laughs> never let that happen. So I used to like – when I used to do the draft stuff, right – I used to just talk about the players I liked. And if there was someone that I looked at them and I looked at the measurables and I didn't like it, I would just sort of ignore them. And Gabe Davis was one of those guys where like I saw his bad 40 time, et cetera. Like I sort of just ignored him throughout the entire process. So I just put him on a list of now I make sure that I am thorough and I go through every single one of these picks and I read their bio and I read their stories and I look at their measurables and I, you know, I, I make sure that like, I make sure that I go through everybody. I might not put everyone on the board, but I make sure I at least go through everybody before um, I start placing them. And the reason why is because how I just what was fundamentally not prepared when Gabriel Davis was the pick uh, <laughs> when we did that show uh, three years ago. Um, all right, gentlemen, before we head out, how about we do this? 
We each take a guy that we think is a good early, early-ish round, maybe two through four, and one guy that we would take as our guy in sort of the later rounds. It doesn't have to be locked in. We're gonna do, mm-hmm. we're gonna do our uh, no matter what lists uh, right before the draft. So every year we do mm-hmm. our no matter what list based on the movie The Draft Day. Remember when? Uh, um, oh God, why am I blanking on Chadwick Boseman's character? Fonte Mac, no matter Fonte what, Mac, no on matter the what. post-it. So we do our no what matter a cast what list. that movie had, by uh, the way. What yeah. a cast. Yeah. Uh, we do our no matter what lists. The guys at one guy at each position, no matter what, that we are standing for. We do that right before the draft. So we have time to change. Uh, but for now, let's pick one early ish round guy, one late round guy that we stand for. Uh, Dave, I'll start with you. What's an early round guy and a late round guy that you stand for? Yeah, I mean, the early ish round guy I'll stand for is Rashad White. I just think that he gets the slight edge for me over James Cook right now because of I, I believe he has three down back ability um, and the dude is just silky smooth as a receiver, like better receiver than James Cook. I mean, mm-hmm. just the fact is he's a better receiver um, and he wouldn't be a tendency tendency giveaway. So he'd be my early ish guy. And then uh, you guys have seen those uh, for late round. You guys have seen those those stupid flags. And I apologize to people in the comment section if they have them. But like, you know, those house divided flags where they have like the one school on one side and the other on the other side. For like, if your parents have like kids that go to like rival schools, yeah, it's something around North Carolina because you got a lot of UNC and state and a lot of UNC and Duke, and it's just, it's just stupid. So, I'll do my house divided late round with Ty Chandler and Bam Knight, give myself a bonus bonus there with my house divided UNC versus NC State. So I'll go mm-hmm. with uh, with those two guys. All right, Kendall, how about you? We got Bills Mafia STF. He's with you. He's got Rashad White and Ty Chandler. Not bad two picks either. I like those two. What do you got, Kendall? Uh, So early round, I'm going to stand with my guy, Isaiah Spiller. I have him as RB1, much to everyone's chagrin, seemingly. (laughs) Um, I I just, I see it. I don't know what other people aren't seeing. I understand what everyone's seeing in Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker, because I like all those guys too. I just, I like Isaiah Spiller more. I think he's more well-rounded and better in some of the areas that those guys aren't so great. So give me Isaiah Spiller as my early-ish round guy. Um, what are we constituting as late round? Anything fifth round or later. Okay. Um, give me Pacheco. I, I really like the upside that Pacheco offers mm-hmm. because right now he's kind of that Zach Moss-ish type replacement guy because of his running demeanor but I think his mm-hmm. upside and his potential is greater than that, where he can become a true three down back. So I, I I'm very intrigued by what Pacheco can do at the next level. All right. I'm going to go, I'm going to close things out here. I should go, I should go Brees Hall for Randy, but I'm not going to go Brees Hall, but everyone know that I love Brees Hall. I think he's an every now and back. Um, I, I, I'm going with Tyler Beatty again. You know, like I said, he's my baddie. I'm going to ride or die with Tyler Beatty throughout this entire process. I think he adds a Michael Carter type of, of skill set to the Buffalo Bills offense, which I think the passing game uh, could really, really utilize. So I'm going to go with Tyler Beatty there um, to add sort of a little bit of a turbo to the backfield of this offense. And then late, I'm just going to stick with, uh, you know, just to just to mess with Casey Reed a little bit. I'm going to stick with the Florida State guy, Jay Sean Corbin. North, South, um, had a huge East-West Shrine game. Um, you know, North South guy, he's a really good in pass protection. So later on in the draft, you're getting a guy who can come in and can pass protect. You're getting a guy who can go North South and you're getting a guy that's a lot of people say could be a better receiver if he was given more opportunities. So checks a lot of boxes for a late round guy. He's got some good traits, had a good combine, has a good rad. So, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to go with Jay Sean Corbin as one of my late round guys. I do like Ty Chandler the most, but I'm going to go with, I'm going to go should with, we uh, do, should we, <laughs> since we all like him, should we do a air raid hour? Seal of approval. Maybe we should seal do that. Air raid hour seal of approval on like James Cook since no one picked them. Or yeah, you know, and uh, and 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 yeah, James Cook gets the seal of approval, and Robin Till comes in and says Cameron Harris uh, as well. So, um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that should just about do it for this evening. We're going to continue doing these types of series. We got lined up on Thursday. We're going to be doing the same exact thing with wide receivers. That's going to uh, so that should be super interesting. I think we're going to skip over tight ends for now. Uh, then we're going to hit up interior offensive line. We're going to hit up cornerbacks. We're going to make sure we hit those positions 
the positions of the most need. And then we'll probably do like a smorgasbord show where we like combine tight ends and offensive tackles and we combine like, you know, edge rushers and, um, and uh, defensive tackles. Uh, I honestly think maybe we can do a linebacker show of our own. So it's not even on my list because it wasn't even a thought when I made this list. Uh, So we might even do a linebacker show as well. So that's, what's going to be coming up in the next, you know, two, three weeks outside of any updates and free agency, we are going deep dive position by position, setting the draft board. And then that way, when we get to the, you know, the, the week or two before the draft, you know, we can start to talk about first round targets, day two targets, day three targets, hit all the positions, um, get some special guests on to give their expertise. Uh, and then obviously give our, no matter what lists. And, um, we're just over a month away until the NFL draft. And we got you covered here at cover one, the air raid hour will be handling night one of the draft. Um, I know disguise coverage, Anthony Prohaska will be handling night two. We'll be joining him. And I do believe the hoof guys will be handling day three or either way. It'll be like a team effort from cover one guys. So, um, Cover one's going to have you covered every second of the draft. Uh, and we got some exciting things in the works for you there. So uh, before you head out, if you haven't already, make sure you smash that like button. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, if you're listening on demand, first of all, thank you for getting here uh, to the one hour and 46 minute mark. Uh, and uh, leave a, a comment and we'll make sure over the course of the week to get back at you. We had like 6,000 people watch our last show. Absolutely incredible. Like absolutely incredible. Thank you guys so much. If you think anyone would enjoy what you just listened to here, tell them to come out and check the air raid hour. I'll make sure after the show to timestamp everything and segment everything so they can just listen to whatever piques their interest. Uh, And if you're listening in the audio form, this will be two podcasts tomorrow. There will be the first 40 minutes of the show where we talked about free agency and then the back hour of the show uh, where we talked about running backs in the draft. So there'll be two podcasts available to anyone who wants to listen on their car ride to work or anything like that tomorrow morning. So thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, until next time, ladies and gents, go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Are we having fun yet?